I'm Asif Kasim. I'm an interventional cardiologist based at Croydon and King's. Uh, trained in medicine in Cambridge, stayed there for five years and did house jobs in that region. And then I went to Birmingham and I did SHA training for two years in Birmingham. And then a one year cardiology rotation in Portsmouth, followed by a specialist training number in the West Midlands in Birmingham and Coventry. Um, and after that, I went back to Cambridge to do a PhD. Um, and so that's where I got my British Heart Foundation Fellowship and I was there for three years. So my PhD was based around looking at why smooth muscle cells misbehave in atherosclerosis, how they behave differently, why they cause atheroma and calcification, and comparing that to stem cell biology. And there were some interesting parallels that came out of that. And at the same time, I worked with colleagues in Yale on an angiogenesis model, trying to grow blood vessels. So work that we'd done in the lab in Cambridge, I then took to the lab in Yale as part of the same fellowship with additional support. So I spent a few months each year there working with colleagues on that. So one of the most important things that you learn how to do in a fellowship and doing your PhD is to read research papers critically and be able to synthesise lots of research papers into uh, some idea of how the landscape looks in any specialty. Um, so I haven't done any lab-based research since then, but I've been active in cardiology research, interventional cardiology research, and those basic research techniques remain the same. So I've been a chief and principal investigator for multi-centre trials of cardiology devices and techniques. Um, I've worked with um, people who are developing new technologies and new devices to use in patients. So all of that research training was very, very relevant as to how you analyse published data, how you set up research trials, how you conduct research trials and so on. It's useful to be able to read papers that are published in any journal with that critical eye as to how that particular publication impacts on the specialty as a whole and how it might change your practice. When I was a, an interventional fellow in Milan, we were doing lots of work with doctors around the world trying to help and educate them. And at the time, people were still posting CDs of angiograms to one another. So I worked with the team that I'd worked on for the sports network and we built a professional network for cardiologists as a website. We got some funding from the DTI, some R&D funding to build some software that converted those DICOM medical images into a better format and anonymized them. So that had two or 3,000 cardiologists sharing and discussing cases. And so that's where my interest in technology, my interest in education merged. Um, and then I started as a consultant in Croydon, working very hard to help develop services and that ran in the background as my kind of network of colleagues helping to learn from each other. And then when I stopped my clinical director role, we did a lot of work with doctors and medical students and workshops to look at how they communicate. And we realized that clinical case discussion is like the unit currency of how doctors share information. When I talk to people outside medicine, I say that if clinical trials and research tell you what to do, then case discussion tells you how to do it whether that's in terms of which drugs or devices to use or which techniques or procedures or how to apply all of that complicated evidence and all those guidelines to specific patients or types of patients. So the proposition that we put together three or four years ago was how could we enable doctors to use their own smartphone in a compliant way to capture, share and discuss clinical cases and to make that above the bar for patient privacy and confidentiality to make it compliant in terms of data regulations like GDPR, compliant for the GMC and HIPAA. So we launched MedShare in October 2015. We had about 1,000 doctors who tested it. It took around six months to get up to 10,000 members, a year to get to 100,000 members. We've now got over 600,000 members in 190 countries covering every specialty. And it's fascinating to see how doctors are using this. Um, a lot of it is around sharing their experiences, their skills, their techniques. Some of it is around doctors in developing countries who don't have access to the conferences, being able to connect with their international networks. We've had doctors using it in refugee camps to get specialist opinions during the refugee crisis. And around half our doctors are senior doctors, consultants, professors, surgeons, trained GPs. But we've got a lot of junior doctors and trainees as well who use it to learn from one another. I think we've got around 30,000 junior doctors and students in ECG discussion groups, just as one example. 
So it's a really powerful way to extend your experience beyond your own clinical setting and to learn from people from elsewhere. We're in a really interesting place. We've got a network that's growing very quickly. We're getting 20 to 30,000 new members a month. It's global and it's multi-specialty. And doctors can connect in groups that can be open or closed. So we built MedShare right from the beginning to be able to operate as a platform. So we work with a wide range of partners. So for example, we work with people like BMJ Group, with, um, we've got some things going on with Elsevier and MIMS and other people where we support their learning content. We're working with a range of NHS trusts and private hospitals and others to connect their clinicians to one another. So creating communities and networks for them to share information. We've got a first in kind joint appointment series with Health Education England where our MedShare HEE fellows are working on how we can use MedShare informal training and accreditation. So for doctors to use MedShare to share and discuss cases and use that as evidence of their reflection, learning or engagement. But there is a huge amount of data that comes out of this. We're very protective and our starting point was around protecting privacy for both the patients and the doctors. But it's very interesting to learn what doctors think about specific therapy areas or conditions or diagnoses. So we can already pull out clinical insights. So we can look at MedShare and we can understand how doctors are treating diabetes in the Middle East compared to how they're treating it in the USA. And that has a big impact. Some of that data we can pull out from, from the system using queries and, uh, and database queries. And what we're looking at is how we build the artificial intelligence to help analyze the trends through the data. And the first output from that would probably be reports looking at trends in cardiovascular medicine, trends in oncology, and so on. And also then using that artificial intelligence to help guide and invite doctors to discuss particular areas where there's a lot of interest. I think, as, I think cardiologists, and particularly interventional cardiologists, are very interested in technology. It's part of the specialty in terms of the devices that we use. And every clinician now is involved in electronic patient records, data handling, and things like that. One of the um, most important developments we should look to have is some kind of effective uh, patient-held record. And for me, the perfect patient-held record will be something that every patient can hold, that they have control of, that is secure, and that can interact readily with every healthcare professional and healthcare system that they encounter. So there's an element there of having it uh, freely available, the interoperability, how that impacts on patient records in hospitals. And here at Croydon, I was clinical director for a few years during the period where we went from being um, having lots of IT systems to having a single solution system that tried to cover most of the hospital and make it paperless. It was pretty painful to put it in, but it's been very effective in lots of ways. And so now anybody can access a patient's record without having to wait for that big bundle of paper notes. And what we know is that there are technical solutions out there that we use every day in our lives, but translating that quality of technology into effective clinical solutions is often slow because of the compliance and those issues. So I think there is a place for smaller uh, companies that work quickly with agile development methods to work in partnership with bigger players. As I say, for me, the biggest thing would be an effective patient health record. There are lots of other things out there that come out of that because if you have an effective patient health record that integrates information, that becomes an amazing tool for research and development as well.